As always with a question, let's start by reading. Green Corporation decided to change from the double diminishing balance method, also called the declining balance method, of depreciation to the straight line method, effective January 1, 2021. The following information was provided by the company. We've got the year, their net income or loss reported in that year, and also the excess of the double diminishing balance method over the straight line method. So in this case, the question did not give us the amount that was actually charged on the income statement using the double diminishing balance. Instead, they just said, well, if we had used straight line instead of double diminishing, this is the difference because double diminishing balance has higher depreciation expense in the first half of the life of the asset. It's an excess of double diminishing balance over the straight line. Note that 2017 was their first year of operations. The company has a December 31st year end. The tax rate is 20%. Notice that we're assuming in this question that the tax rate was 20% for all prior years, as well as the current year. No dividends were declared or paid until 2021. 15,500 of dividends were declared and paid in December 2021. Income for the year ended December 31st, 2021, calculated using the new accounting policy, so they used straight line, was $81,500. Let's move the page down to see the required. Assuming that the change in policy was implemented retrospectively, present the retained earnings column of Green's Statement of Changes in Equity for 2021. So I think what we need first is a clear understanding of how depreciation expense affects net income, because we can't do this calculation unless we understand that. Let's assume we have a company, ABC Company. ABC Company could use either diminishing balance or straight line. Now their choice of method should definitely be based not on which method maximizes income or minimizes income or does anything like that. No, they should choose the depreciation method that best matches the depreciation expense to the revenue it helps to generate. What I'm doing here is not looking at which method maximizes or minimizes net income. I am simply talking about a company that previously thought that diminishing balance was the best method because it appropriately matched the expense to the revenue it helped to generate. But then they discover that straight line actually does better matching, which is why they want to switch. Just want to make that clear before we go forward. So now let's look at income before income tax and depreciation expense. 20000 under diminishing balance and 20000 under straight line. They would both be 20000 because we haven't included depreciation expense, which changes between these two methods. Now, let's deduct the depreciation expense under these two methods. Under diminishing balance, assume that the depreciation expense would be 8000 And we're going to deduct that from the income before income tax and depreciation expense. Under straight line, assume it would be 3000 So now, what is the income before income taxes? Under diminishing balance, it would be 12000 And under straight line, it would be 17000 Now, assume the company has a 20% tax rate. So I want to put the income tax expense. That would be 12000 times 20%, which would be 2400 For the straight line method, it would be 17000 times 20%, which would be 3400 That now allows us to calculate net income. For diminishing balance, 9,600. For straight line, 13,600. Notice the change between these two amounts of income is $4,000. Is there some other way I could calculate this difference? And the answer is actually, yes, there is. What if I looked at the difference between the two depreciation expense charges? The 8,000 under the diminishing balance and the 3,000 under the straight line. The difference here is $5,000. But how can I tie that in to the difference between the net income under these two methods? Because I have a $5,000 difference in the depreciation expense, but only a $4,000 difference in the actual net income. That's because I haven't yet taken into account the impact of income taxes on the expense. Think about the fact that under diminishing balance, the expenses are higher. If the expenses are higher, then the income before income tax is lower. 
and we take less taxes. So every time we report an expense on the income statement, it actually reduces our income tax expense because a higher expense will cause the income tax expense to go down. So if I want to reflect the after-tax impact of depreciation expense, I have to look at what the expense would have been if I had taken income taxes into account. So I'm going to multiply this times 100% minus the 20%. If I multiplied it just times the 20%, I would get the income tax expense impact. But I want to know what would be depreciation expense after taxes. This will give me depreciation expense after taxes. And guess what that amount is? $4,000. So the difference in the net income is equal to the difference in the after-tax depreciation expense. So if I take the difference in depreciation expense, net of taxes, I can figure out how the net income would change. This is exactly what I have to do for this question. Let's go back up to the question. We can now see that the third column is actually the additional depreciation expense, 5,500 in 2017. If I multiply this amount by 100% minus the tax rate of 20%, it will tell me how much net income or loss will change by if I switch over to the straight line depreciation method. The change in the loss for 2017 would be 4,400 higher. So this would reduce our net loss. I wouldn't have a net loss anymore of $23,700 if I use straight line. Instead, if I use straight line, because my expense would reduce, my net loss would be smaller. My net loss would only be $19,300, which is the $23,700 less the $4,400. Because of course I would have a lower expense, which would cause less of a loss. Let's keep going. In 2018, if I did the same thing, multiplied at times 100% minus the 20%, the change in my income would be a higher income of 13200 So my net income would be $13,200 higher than the 38400 that I actually reported. Keep going. This change would be $11,040 for 2019. 6,160 higher. So remember, I would have to retroactively change all prior years, which would mean if I showed the whole financial statements from let's say 2020, my depreciation expense would go down by $7,700. My income tax expense would go up by 20% of that. And my net income would go up by $6,160 if I'm looking at just 2020. Let's go back to the required. What did they actually ask us to do? Assume that the change in policy was implemented retrospectively. Present the retained earnings column of Green's Statement of Changes in Equity for 2021 only. So I'm not showing any comparative years. I'm just going to show 2021, the Statement of Changes in Equity. So let's take a look at it. Of course, with all Statement of Changes in Equity, we're going to start with the company name, Green Corporation. We're going to then do the name of the statement. We've only been asked to show the column for retained earnings, so this is a partial statement of changes in equity. We then do the proper dating. In this case, because it's the statement of changes in equity, we have to do year ended. December 31st, 2021. So what would I start with? Well, because all prior years would not have been restated as yet, I'm going to have to start with the retained earnings at January 1st, 2021. What would that retained earnings be? Well, I know what it would be. Go back to the question. The question states that no dividends were paid or declared in the 2017, 18, 19, and 20 year. So retained earnings is equal to net income minus dividends since inception. Inception was in 2017. So if I add together net income and losses, 
it will tell me what was retained earnings at December 31st, 2020, because the retained earnings from December 31st, 2020 becomes my retained earnings for January 1st, 2021, and that would be 96,100. So this is equal to my retained earnings at January 1st, 2021, without a change to the accounting policy. Let's put it in. What do I have to do now? I have to show the change in accounting policy. What would be the impact of the change in accounting policy from 2017 for all four years? Let's go back to our calculations. That would be the total of all the after-tax changes that I already calculated here in green. If I add all four numbers up, that will tell me the total impact of the change from diminishing balance to straight line over all four years. And that's 34800 If I had used the straight line method, my retained earnings at January 1st, 2021 would have been $34,800 higher. I could check that by changing every single one of these net incomes by the amount that I calculated in green and then adding the updated net income altogether. But I can just show it by simply determining what is the impact of the change cumulatively for all four years. Let's put it on our statement. 34800 so now what would be retained earnings on January 1st, 2021 restated? 130,900. Now I can continue with the retained earnings column just like I would for any other statement of changes in equity. The first thing I would do is have to add in the net income. The net income that was given in the question was 81,500 and that 81,500 already used the new method of depreciation so I can just use it here. I also have to include the dividends that were declared and or paid in 2021. 15,500. What would be my retained earnings at December 31st, 2021? 196,900. This updated amount would be taken to the Statement of Financial Position, also called the balance sheet, under the equity section, retained earnings. What have we learned from this question? Whenever there is a change in accounting policy, we need to retrospectively change all prior period financial statements. That's in order to be compliant with the conceptual framework, qualitative characteristics, both comparability and relevance. Change in accounting policy.